So, welcome to the session, uh, minutes to second, how we use volatile storage to power dispatching algorithms, and how we went from a journey of matching uh, captains to customers within minutes to within seconds. That's the title, minutes to seconds. So, what to expect? How to ingest fast-moving data uh, using in-memory storage, storing volatile data for efficient lookups, real-time uh, decision-making using uh, sub-millisecond lookups, and recommended practices. So, but before we delve into the presentation, into the solution, uh, if, uh, let's, let us spend a few minutes of who we, who we are. We are Kareem, founded in 2012. Uh, the word Kareem comes from an Arabic word Kareem itself, which means generosity, mean giving back to the community or uh, to your circle. Uh, we were founded in 2012, born and bred in the Middle East. We are the first unicorn out of the region, and we call ourselves a unicamel instead of a unicorn. But why do we exist? Uh, we exist to simplify the lives and simplify and improve the lives of people and build an awesome organization that inspires. Uh, at the moment, we are simplifying lives by using a, our ride hailing platform, and in the future, we will dwell into further uh, verticals of the same problem. Now, before we go even further, let's just talk about our region. Our region is slightly different than most of the mature markets that in, in the western side of the world. Uh, the infrastructure is virtually not existent. Whatever there is, is you know, very poor, unclean, and unsafe. Um, most, and most important aspect, women form about 49% of our demographic, yet majority of the women are unable to work because of the bad or poor infrastructure. post kareem era, we have seen an uptick in the number of women who are able to work by using our own, our right healing platform as well. So we have sort of changed the region and into that, with that respect as well. So let's, before we go deeper into the solution, I would like to set the, uh, set the context of the, some of the problems or the ground realities that we face. And, you know, because those are the realities that form the basis of some of the decisions that we took. So ground, uh, ground conditions. Uh, as I said, a poor infrastructure, people spent, uh, people were stuck in hours, uh, for hours in traffic. Uh, the region is populous and security, security challenge. In some of the cities, estimating ETAs is very challenging because the intersections are very, quite far apart. And due to, in some cities, high speeds, if a captain or a driver misses an intersection, then the ETA increases exponentially to reach the destination. And social norms, we, our region has is a very traditional region, has, still has a lot of social norms, like in some parts of a region, women cannot still drive, and some parts, women cannot share a ride with men as well. So all these conditions together put a great strain, uh, limit our solution capability, and we have to tackle these to deliver a compelling experience to our region. Basics. Uh, we call our drivers, we call the drivers that use our, that from the supply part of our system, captains. The captains, uh, the word driver, sorry, before we go into deeper, uh, the word driver has a very negative connotation or impact in our society, in our region particularly. And we wanted to change that. We, we, don't want, we don't want our captains to be known as just be drivers or chauffeurs, but rather be owners of their own destiny. And build and work with us to change the region. So we call them captains. Who is a captain? Captain is someone who is a person in command, and it's a team. It's so all of our drivers are captains, and that's what we'll refer to them by in the future slides as well. Our captains are the essence of whatever we do. Uh, they wear the uniform of what we stand for every day. They are the, pe they are the people behind the wheel driving us, uh, driving, our mo uh, driving our mission to uh, improve the lives of people. So now we, we have set the notion of ground, uh, ground conditions and what we call captains. What is a marketplace? It's a conduit where we match uh, customers, captains. We match supply with demand. A customer is someone who wants to travel from point A to B or further, and captain is someone who has a vehicle and wants to drive uh, to earn money. And a vehicle is not particularly restricted to just being a four-wheel car. It can be a you know, bus, it can be a bicycle, or it can be a motor rickshaw as well. Uh, as we said, uh, yeah, so marketplace is a conduit where we match uh, 
supply with demand. We need to make uh, real-time decisions because of the real-time nature of our marketplace. Now, customers in this day will not wait for long on any app. They will change their decisions. They can grab a taxi or move to, you know, even worse, move to a competition. Sorry. Now, our marketplace has three important characteristics that we want to solve for, that we needed to solve for, reliability. This whole ride-hailing platform or business is about reliability. Reliability, we define, has different meanings for different actors of a system. So one important actor, customer. It's the trust that they will be able to get a car anytime they need a car, or they, anytime they want to go anywhere, because if they have this trust, they will be a return customers and keep coming back to your platform. Now, for captains, it's the trust that they will be able to use our system to make a living. That's the most basic trust that we want to instill in our system as well. Now, the second most important aspect is match quality. Uh, so we call, we, we, call, we call a match of, is of the highest quality if we can match a captain with a customer who can reach the customer in the least amount of time, that is ETA, while also spending the least amount of fuel so that he does not, the captain does not spend his own cash while going to get a, custom, a captain to a customer to make money. Uh, tracking. As I said uh, previously, that our region is a bit security challenge, so we need to provide ability for our customers to be able to track their relatives or loved ones and be able to track them at a very granular level. So that's where tracking comes in, forms a very important aspect of our system. And we want to be, and we, we want to be able to serve our customers by pinging as often as possible. Now, if you remember our uh, basic ground condition that the intersections are quite far apart. So if your captains are pinging quite far apart, the last known ping or last known location could be very far from his or her current location as well. So that ties into our tracking aspect as well. Now that said, when we started off, we had humble captains, right? The region is not super rich. So we had humble captains who did not have extra cash to buy expensive smartphone devices like Nexus or high-end Samsungs, but rather some low-end Chinese or you know, basic handsets that were available. Now these devices itself form a very important part of the equation because low-end devices generally sacrifice on the GPS quality. They have chipsets that, not, that are not very accurate and you know, add add a noise to the GPS readings, which makes metering and tracking a little bit difficult as well. Plus, our region is, is always a neighbor to, is, is in the neighborhood of a desert always, everywhere. So the summertime temperatures vary from 46 degrees centigrade to 56 degrees centigrade. Now what happens is, even though the captains are driving an air-conditioned car, but metal-based phones heat up, and what happens is this also impacts their uh, GPS and data connectivity and also affects the CPU cycle, so we cannot, uh, we cannot have an app that is very CPU intensive running on Captain Apps because it will drain more bandwidth to work and run the CPU and run the fan to cool down the device itself. And so, limited bandwidth. Now, you know, ride-hailing platform, if, you, if a captain is sending his locations to the, uh, to the system quite often, it will be a very chatty app. Uh, chatty apps need a lot of bandwidth or consume a lot of bandwidth. So, we needed to, but bandwidths in our region are very expensive. Even at that, uh, one GB of bandwidth will cost you uh, somewhere around 75 to 100 dirhams per month, which is, you know, which is a lot of money for humble captains. So uh, we, need to, we want to ensure that we use the least amount of bandwidth to deliver a compelling evidence. And in some cases, we figured out that when we first went live, we were out that 40% of our bandwidth is actually consumed by the HTTPS handshakes. So, you know, tackling that problem was also a uh, important. Now, plus, you know, we want, first we wanted to make sure that we solve that part and ensure that the payloads are very small enough. And you can, you know, without sacrificing the data or all the data that we are sending, the only known uh, solution for, you know, reducing the payload was compression. But even at that, you, want, you needed to ensure that the compression algorithm is not eating up all your CPU itself. So, you know, no need for compression if the device cannot work given the CPU. So these were some of the issues that we had um, when we started off. Now, when, as you build a solution or solve this problem of ride hailing, 
you always want to be able to measure the quality of your solution or what you have delivered. And we thought hard about some of the, how can we measure the quality of a solution? And some, we, these four matrix form a core part of it. ETA, ETA has two dimensions, right? One is a promise ETA, what we show the customer, hey, we can get your car in two minutes. But delivering, making, ensuring that the customer gets that same service is another part matter. So we call that part the time, the actual time that the, it took for the captain to reach the customer as an actual ETA. Now, in a highly functional and a very transparent and super performing system, this, the delta between the promise and the actual ETA needed to be very small. It didn't, you know, doesn't matter, the ETA is nine minutes, nine minutes. But, you know, nine minutes at the time of booking, but in actual, if it's 15 minutes, then it deliver, the experience gets, you know, bad for the customer and he will never. So for nine minutes, if the captain reaches in 10 minutes, that's fine, you know, things happen on the road. So the delta needs to be very small between the two. Now, time needed to make the match. As I said, customers spend, want to spend a very small amount of time on the app itself. And we want to change lives, improve lives by helping them get a very quick match. So we want, we needed to ensure that, it, that the time it took for the system to find the best captain, then match them, and then send the notification out that this is your captain on its way, needed to be very small. So when we started off, it was quite high, but as we went on, we realized that this time needed to be very small, uh, you know, preferably in milliseconds, but seconds was also good enough. As previously as well, age of captain location. So when you're tracking a captain, it's important that you know as in real time, the, real, the most real time location of a captain, not a location which, is, which was three or four minutes apart. So in some parts of a region, driving speeds can be up to 120 miles per hour, or 120 kilometers per hour. And within three minutes, it could be five to six kilometers away from your previous location, which making the whole purpose of tracking redundant. Now, ratio of request match, this actually gives you an insight into how well your system is doing. Now, this will also depend if you have enough supply. If you have you know, demand of more than supply, then you know, this metric will also be bad. But let's assume that you have enough supply to meet your demand. Now, if that condition is true, this ratio, this ratio will give you a very numerical insight into how well your algorithm is performing. Because you know, we cannot fulfill 100% of the request. That's the nirvana, that's we all want to achieve, but that's not possible. So, but we want to be in the range of 70 to 80% where you know, we are able to match 70% uh, or 80% of the, or can we match 80% of the request and convert them into rides and revenue. Now, condensing all the, all the previous slides into four basic points, that we want to find the best captain with, in the minimum amount of time. We want an ability to provide an upfront ETA, which we call a promised ETA, lowest, promised, uh, lowest possible data, delta between the promised and the actual ETAs, and the ability to look up a captain's location and set us for tracking purposes, the gist of the previous few slides. Now, let's go into a take one. You know, we, we were starting off and we loved simplicity. So we wanted, we built a very simple solution, took MySQL, put all, built the data structures, built a backend and start sending everything over HTTP and HTTPS over time. Now, this worked, but given the metrics, you will see when we go down, uh, it worked, but it did not deliver a compelling experience and the reasons we'll figure out as well. Before we go into the reasons, let's just, important to state some of the scale that we had at that time when this statement was built. Yeah, now, when we ran into this, when the system went live, it worked a lot of times, but performance was a bigger uh, factor. Now, performance was heard primarily because of dead logs. We built, uh, we, you know, we were fresh out of college, we built a highly normalized system, we, you know, each table had a foreign key to the parent. Now, even if, even if a child table which has a reference to a parent is being updated in separate transactions, it still runs into a dead log issue because it, it will wait for the other transaction to complete. It was actually a bug with MySQL at that time. Now, when we started off, we had MySQL 5.6, which had new, no geospatial support, which means looking up captains was not trivial, and we did that by using a Heberstein formula, which calculates a specific distance between two uh, coordinates. Um, now, once we started, we wanted to ping as often as possible, 
But given the issues that we had, we had to reduce the frequency to every a ping by captain every 60 seconds. Now, all these affected our ETAs and customer experience, plus it also had a cost impact because we had to use over provision servers, faster servers to get around the deadlock issues as well. Now, this was the performance that we measured at that time, but it was okay, but not excellent. These were the important factors because of the downward spiral of a deadlock and application being frozen and a downtime, reliability was bad, 40% at about, so we were only able to match 40% of our requests. This meant by we were investing more into the system but getting very few returns on our revenue on the business side of it. Our uptime was about 95% at that time. Now, we at Kareem, we had a culture always, you know, we failure, we always do a retro and learn from and improve systems rather than, you know, blaming and shaming everyone or who built the system. So, few learnings that we had along the way that we had to avoid logs and there were few strategies to avoiding logs that we had considered um, all had a lot of cost and some of those strategies were aborting our use of foreign keys but that will lead to a data, uh, uh, data quality problem. Uh, acquiring exclusive logs, now that's a very tricky to get right and has its own set of problems or throughput issues that you will encounter. Now, then we change our logic such that everything goes into a queue and no updates are happening at the same time. No two updates are happening on the same row or the same record at the same time. Uh, that would have been a very bad solution in spec because scaling that out would be a difficult problem. Or we could change our MySQL version, move to 5.7 and see, try things out. We moved to 5.7, that did help out, but yeah, was not helping out with our scaling needs. Now, we needed a mechanism to support microsecond lookups because if a lookup is taking one minute for during an algorithm where you're matching multiple captains, most of your time is spent using uh, doing lookups instead of doing the actual part, which is finding if this captain is best for this request or not. That involves a lot of things, calculating ETAs, building models, running models, and whether this captain will be able to make the trip in time or not. So these were a few learnings that we had. The most important that I really like is, is the learning that a coordinate or a location is a multi, it's a vector, right? It's a multi-dimensional attribute. And storing them in a single column is pretty difficult. And without that, uh, utilizing indexing was pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty difficult. So we, what was clear is that we needed to come up with a mechanism of representing a coordinate in a, as a scalar value. Now, when we were building the next version, of our system, we first went in and want, you know, we didn't want to be simple, but we want to be thorough with the system. So we identified some of the pillars that our system should uphold. So it was schemaless, that we should be able to change uh, the model or schema at any time without requiring a downtime. So in MySQL, if you have a table, a schema which has a very high transaction, number of transactions happening on it, changing or altering the schema without taking a downtime is uh, not so trivial. It's super difficult to get it right. So it should be near good enough as a schema less buffer queues. So in the right handling platform, you already have, you have a consistent supply, which is dedicated captains working on your platform. But you also have this uh, transient or part timers that come on your system and earn money. So typically at morning rush hours or evening rush hours, you'll see more captains, more and more captains coming online or going away from work and you know wanting to make money on the same ride. This meant that you, the scale on the system or the load on the system will double during those times. And we wanted to be ability that we, uh, we handle this increase, a sudden increase in a, uh, in a graceful manner. So we decided that we needed some kind of a buffer or queue mechanism instead of a direct HTTP endpoint to deal with those spikes as well. Now, uh, second, uh, you know, we needed persistence that, we, need, we only needed persistence to serve long-term lookups. So let's say if I'm a customer, I will go back and look at my trip, you know, really. So it meant that most, you know, persistence storage was not really necessary, but it can be done in an offline manner or in a slow processing manner. But dispatching needed real-time information. It needs information right now, right this second, or, you know, close to this second. So that's where we choose uh, Redis as our caching mechanism. 
right? Uh, SQ is to buffer the pings that are coming in, and DynamoDB as a long-term, uh, you know, persistent storage, which was done as a an offline system uh, in parallel to the real-time uh, storage of pings in Redis. Now, why Redis? Redis has a unique architecture where it is single threaded, but it is lock free in the sense. So, you know, you don't run into the same issues of multiple up updates in a, uh, and multiple updates on the same uh, key running into a deadlock. Uh, it has a very rich set of strings and sorted sets where it takes care of your sorting at, at the database level instead of your application doing the sortings and provides a lot of built-in operations to process data at a very fast speed. Pipelining is another technique where you can use pipelining and use one connection to serve thousands and thousands of requests without waiting for a response. Plus, it also provides you know, this uh, read scale-out strategy by using a primary and a replica configuration where you can build, uh, you, know, you can scale out reads and provide a fail so failover support as well. So this is how a take two looked like. So we had pings coming into an SQL scheme, being read by a worker, and being stored in different Redis clusters over time. At the same time, they were being written to DynamoDB, which had a very low you know, SLA, that if the ping was written after five minutes, that's no problem. But a ping that came into a real-time system had to be written in a very real-time mission. That's why that part was given more computational powers, or uh, computation, uh, computational power, versus the part that was writing to DynamoDB. Now let's look at some of the data structures that we had. It was a very key, uh, key value system. We had a captain ID and the value, the ping that came against the system. And it was uh, easy to look up given uh, because the keys were deterministic and very easy to look up. Now, this one is a bit different. So to solve for the looking up, you know, looking up captains and nearby near a location or near a request, what we said, we used Redis does not provide this capability out of the box. So we had, we used the assorted set structure a little bit differently, where we said, let's define a key. Let's define a key, and a define, we define a key as a composite of a geohash versus the product that a captain was serving. So let's say we had a offering which says business cards, right? And we divided our uh, entire geographical region into geohashes. So geohashes has this wonderful capability that the, uh, you can, if the, the less number of digits that you use, you have a higher zoomed out level as well. Uh, comes out of the box with it. So we said, let's take the, take the uh, level five, which gives you about a, uh, a kilo, the radius of about 20 kilometers, and you can cover your whole city by using not that many geohashes as well. So we created keys, so indexes, this become indexes. So business, this geohash, index. Now all captains that are qualified for business cards will be placed in this index. So meaning in that sorted set. Sorted set has a well, um, provides you a, an attribute which, is, which they call score as a double, and we use that value to store the last timestamp of the ping. So when the last captain last ping, and when we look up those captains by just saying, hey, give us all captains within the score current timestamp minus 30 seconds or 180 seconds, it will give you a pre-sorted set of captains ASAP to your application. Now, this is when a captain was pinging in the captain number 89 was pinging in this geohash. When it moved further along the road, was moving, it will move to the next geoset. That's how we will remove it from the previous geoset and move it into the next geoset, geo, geo index. This made, uh, you know, this really simplified our uh, captain lookups blazing and made them blazingly fast. Just as a reference, it, we created a grid of three geohashes, three by three geohashes and all its neighbors. So dot green being the customer request, we'll figure out all captains in different in the nine geohashes, in the geohash itself, the captain customized in, and the neighboring geohashes. So when once when done in parallel, this led to a super blazing speed. You know, we were able to get eligible captains within no fraction of a second. Now, let's just look at the scale that we had when this take two live went live. 47 cities, 67 custom, 66 million customers, 250,000 captains. Some uh, RET request. Now, what this actually shows that we were able to reduce our ETAs and the difference between, and make the delta between those ETAs consistent. So if you have consistent, yeah, it was still okay, but 
not super excellent, but it was better than good. It was nearer to a very good part and delivered a very good or a compelling experience to our customers. As a result of, because of using a log-free architecture, where be it Redis or anything, uh, our reliability went up quite a bit. And our uptime also hit that magical 99.99 number as well. Just an insight using our new relic structures, how, uh, how fast our lookups were, just to drive home that point. So as a summary, we were, what it meant that we were able to increase the number of, the frequency of pings that a captain was sending every minute from once every second to four every second, that meant a ping every 15 seconds. That it is still not really real, real time, but very close to a real time uh, location as well. Improved our uh, customer ETS and experience as well because we were dispatching captains that were really close to the ca customer uh, and were able to get to the customer in a faster amount of time. Side benefit, because of a ping every 15 seconds, we were able to track captains in at a very granular level. And that's the premise of the slide. We were able to reduce the time to match from about two minutes to 15 seconds. That was the biggest win that we had, uh, we experienced. Now, going a little bit under the hood, we are a proud Java company. We use Spring Boot as a framework, and we use Elastic Beanstalk as our scaling uh, of scaling out of our applications. Now, looking even deeper, Redis has different modes, standalone, where you have just one Redis cluster. Do not recommend it for use in a distributed or a highly scalable system. Uh, another mode, which is primary replica, where you have one primary node and you have multiple replicas with Sentinel support, you can have failover support in case your master dies down. And the cluster node, which is you know sharding uh, sharding the data that you have over, over different keys. And some of the hygiene that we learned or experienced along the ways, all, they always have multiple slaves, not just have one slave or one replica in your cluster. Always configure a backup of your replica or a backup of your data using a replica instead of a master because it will take your master node down for a few seconds. Wait. Now, uh, for writes, never use direct, never write directly to your primary endpoint, but rather, connect to a Sentinel endpoint so that in case a failover happens, your application does not suffer a downtime. And always set aside a certain percentage of the memory for Redis's internal operations, including uh, replication, because Redis is an in-memory replication system. Always scale out, uh, you know, always scale out your reads instead of reading from the primary, because Redis sort of guarantees, not really guarantees, but delivers a you know, non-zero or, you know, a zero lag replication, you can take advantage of the replica and read from the replica and write to the master. That will reduce your load quite a bit. Because remember, Redis is single-threaded. So no matter how many cores your server has, it's always utilizing only one or two cores of your system. So it's very important that you scale out your reads if you have a higher number of reads. What, in my personal opinion, you know, if you have to want to use take advantage of Redis to the fullest, always you know, choose the right client library. There are a lot of client libraries out there, JDS and Lattice. These are very basic in nature, but um, you know, move towards libraries like Lattice, cluster Lattice, which has a, or Redison as well, which is far more mature than their uh, basic versions, and it offers you good outright support, whether you are using with AWS or any other cloud provider or your own solution. Now, we want even further scaling, scaling because business, as we say, is booming. Now, we wanted to increase the frequency of pings for different products that we are building, plus we wanted to all enable even better dispatching, even closer captains, and knowing where the captain is in a really, really, really time matter. Plus, we had more captains on the network. The number of captains and the, num and the demand is always growing. Uh, more captains sitting captains' data for tracking purposes, and, but the business wanted the same performance demand as always, but we also wanted to ensure that we have, you know, a healthy data service or your system is something where everything is balanced. You know, you are utilizing it not at the 100% CPU, but utilizing it such that it always gives you some space for a uh, spike in traffic and certain scaling. Just to, these are some of the numbers that we were now dealing with 80 cities, 15 million customers, nearly half a million captains, uh, 
150 million requests, 140 million pings every day, and nearly 50 million lookups. So we went with clustered. That is also the cluster mode that uses sharding. Uh, it, you can configure it to either shard on your uh, specifications or automatically scale uh, distribute keys uh, equally amongst all uh, shards. So we went with cluster Redis. Each primary had different uh, its own set of replicas. So each set is also uh, read scalable and highly available as well. The best part about of Redis sharding is it's application agnostic that you don't have to build anything in your application code or change your application configuration to take advantage of this. Uh, I think that's the only data store that I've seen that does that at this moment. Now, this is how our take three looked like. Instead of one single Redis, we created, we distributed into different shards with each shard having its own replicas deployed in different zones to provide us a really uh, strong failover support, whether if in case a, uh, a zone goes down or a, because of a, any uh, abnormal activity. Now, this is the same slide I copied because we delivered the same kind of performance. Now, that's all from uh, me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, just before we have a, we have an R and D center at Berlin. We you know if you want come talk to us if you want to ch you know change people's lives and at the same time solve some amazing and challenging technological problems. Come talk to us. We have a booth as well, and we'll have fun. Thank you. Uh, I got two questions from Yap. Uh, if any other questions, just please ask. Uh, did you consider any other NoSQL database aside from Redis? Uh, not really, uh, because Red Redis was something which was providing us, we said that we wanted to store in memory. So we just went with Redis. Um, it had, had, we considered Memcache and Redis, but Memcache has a something of an odd uh, eviction algorithm when it comes to maintaining uh, stale data, so we went with Redis, but not really beyond that. Uh, more on company side, I got a question. Do you background check your captains and do you have any responsibility when problems occur between captains and customers? Yes. As you said, because we are a security challenge and the customers that we get, you know, expect, uh, you know, we deliver certain kinds of security. So, yes, we do background checks, we, but we don't do it ourselves. We outsource them to, you know, law enforcement agencies or a private contractors working closely with law enforcement agencies. Uh, plus, we do a you know, thorough background check where we ch verify a captain's address and everything physically as well. But that's not done by us per se. Okay, that's the two questions I had. Does anyone else have a question for now? We have a couple of minutes left. So. No? Thank you very much. Thank you. And sorry for Thank the inconvenience, <laughs> but please write the app.